I'll tell you what. I love Bill Wilson, and I love his good family. And at the school of preaching, there was a guy named Thurman Bowman. And I think Thurman held the record for crime, and he cried just a little bit more than I did. <laughs> because these guys, I, I tell you, Bill was truly a good friend. Uh, he went through times at school when my wife was ill. And for some of you that don't know, my wife is on the kidney transplant. Uh, and we are praying for her, the kidney. And Will was always there for me. I was in his class and I would call Will. And Will would talk to me, talk to me, let me know what I'm missing. And I'm going to get the notes for me. And Will, I always wanted to say how much I appreciate it. And I won't talk to you because you start coming too. I know you don't. <laughs> Well, we're so glad to be here this evening, and uh, it's indeed my own privilege to be able to travel and preach the Word of God, especially when there's so many capable gospel preachers. And we love Will. He came and preached for us last Thursday night. He had a short lesson. We wanted him to come back uh, and do a fall series. And Brother Jason Hill one is not enough I can say about him. Every time I hear him speak, it's just a wonderful occasion for me. And not to leave out my good brother, brother Philip Patton. He and his good wife, Stephanie, they graduated before uh, we did, but uh, Philip Patton is a wonderful man. He's a good Christian man. He's raised his family up. I talked to him about God and he's just good people. And Philip and I can tell you how much I appreciate all your good words and Everything you've done for us, man, you call in your cards. You know, Tom, we've been through some times. You know that. And my wife is the only and Philip would always call on. So there's some good men in this building tonight, and I really appreciate it. Now, we'll get to preaching. Brother Hillborn touched on several things that. As Will said, they overlap in our lessons tonight. But God wrote the Bible in a way that we should preach the gospel. And we will preach some of the same scriptures sometimes, and we'll make some of the same points sometimes, but we can still drive home two different avenues of point. Now tonight, I want to deal with the kingdom, the house, and the church. The kingdom, the house, and the church. How did God bring about a kingdom? How did God bring about the church? And how did God build a house? Now I want you to understand that it's all in the scripture. When we look at how God set up the kingdom and why he set up the kingdom, as we go back to Genesis 1 and 1, when God created the heavens and the earth, we realize that God made everything perfect. And we realize that we have an adversary from the beginning of time throughout the book of Genesis. And we know that Satan was right there in God's perfect creation. As God made man, the adversary was angry. God knew that he had to set up a system for us. So before man was created, the foundation of the church was already set in order. We know that God is a good God and he would not leave us to be subject or predators or prey to a predator such as Satan. <clears throat> the Bible tells us to be vigilant, to be sober because our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And he is looking for people to uh, catch off guard. He is looking for us not to be vigilant. He's looking for us not to be sturdy and steadfast. He's looking for us not to be a part of the kingdom of God. Those people will be punished. Now I want you to understand that God set in motion this plan. God had good men from the beginning. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Jacob. But I want to talk to you and we're going to start with David for the sake of time. I want you to know that God loved David. And I like how God... Uh, uh, gave David a, a title. We realize that the highest title in the church is 
Sir. The highest title in the church is Sir. And God called David on one occasion his Sir. Do you remember how God said, Job, my servant? Do you remember how he said, Moses, my servant? If God can call you his servant, that is a wonderful thing. And we know David was not perfect. But David had a good heart, and David loved God, and God loved David. So we're going to pick up about 2 Samuel 7, around verse 12, around verse 13. And we realize that David wanted to build God a house. He wanted to build God a house because David had had peace all around him. All of his enemies that God had set in abeyance away from him and gave him peace all around. So God uh, had taken care of David and David appreciated his peace that God had given him. And David said, I want to do something for God. I want to build him a house. And David even talked to the prophet. And the prophet said, go on and do it. But that was not God's plan. Now I want you to understand something. The reason that we have so many different denominations now, because people did not look at the plan of God and went out on their own the way David was about to. But God said, that is not my plan, David. He said, now when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up the seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. God already had a plan for a kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, what did God have already in motion? Before David wanted to do something, David was a wonderful man. God said, I don't need you to come up with a plan for me. I don't need you to build a house for me. I already have a plan in place that I will build a house. After you die, and your seed will come, and he will build me a house. But he talked about Solomon. No, he talked about Solomon. We'll get to who he was talking about a little later on. And I thought Brother Hill was going to keep preaching, and I was sitting there saying, Preach it, brother. Preach it, brother, because he was right on target. He said, I will build a house. In Isaiah 2 and verse 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills and what? All nations. All nations shall flow into what? It. We talked about that house. We talked about that kingdom. We talked about the church. Isn't it wonderful? the church of Christ. Isn't it wonderful to know that you can open the Bible? And see what you're doing is the right thing. You know, I grew up in the church all my life. And my father would take me to church every Sunday, all day Sunday. My father was a preacher. And we had this little Volkswagen van. And he put the church name on the side. And from 8 o'clock in the morning to about 9 o'clock in the morning, People go every Sunday, every Wednesday. And I said, my dad, you know, I hear you preaching. And you said we're the only church. And we are the ones that come to heaven. And I think about it, I'm about 12 years old, and I want to understand it. And he said, son, just listen and go. But do you realize that as a child comes to the church, I just couldn't believe that my friends, who were going to fire us, who was doing all this in church, and you know, they had a band in church. They had music, and they had excitement, and the preacher would jump around and spit and shout, Daddy, why we can't do that? I didn't understand. That church was not in the Bible, because they didn't want to go about what the Bible said. I realized as I got older, no matter what I thought about or had the opinion about, that the church was right. And I realized that I was in the right place at the right time, going in the right direction, and that was able to save me and turn my life around. But I could preach the gospel and be bold about what I thought and what I felt, and I know the church is right now. So why? Because we're able to trace it back 
and we look at it from the prophets, and we can realize that everything we believe is in the Bible. Now, Isaiah 3, verse 2, I mean, chapter 2, verse 3, and many people should go and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he shall teach us his ways, and we will walk in his path, for out of Zion shall go forth the law in the word of the Lord from him, from Jerusalem. Now, Brother Hillborn talked about Jerusalem earlier, and we're going to get to Jerusalem in a little bit. But we realize that God had a kingdom already headed in the right direction. He had a city where he would establish that kingdom from. And guess what else he had? A king. Already. Because remember, in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there was also in the loins a seed that was going to come about that came through David, that came through the rest of them, that Christ was born. That child that was born of the Holy Spirit would be the king of his church, would be the king of the kingdom. And Jesus would establish this kingdom by going through pain and suffering. Why would you want to be a part of anything that Christ can establish? Why would you want to wear a name that other than the church of Christ, that Christ hung, led, and died for. You know, I sometimes look at the names on some of these churches that like Rock and Memphis, Tennessee, and it's so hilarious. They will put any name up other than the name of Christ because they don't want to wear the name of Christ because they don't want to operate under the authority of Christ. So they go get a rock, pilgrim rock, social rock, hard rock, or they go get a mountain, Mount Nebo, Mount Everest, Mount Zion. And they can put on any man. And when they run out of rocks and mountains, they'll go get numbers. First Baptist, Second Baptist, First Presbyterian, Second. Anything other than me. And they're wonderful to be able to wear the name of the second name of the God. Christ. Church of Christ. How do we know? Because Luke 1 and 31 and 33 tells, 33 tells us, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the High, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of who? His father David. And he shall reign over the house of who? Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there shall be no end. God already ordained the church, already set it in motion, already had his kingdom, and now we're going to hear about his kingdom. Can we deny at any time that Jesus is the Son of God according to the scripture? Can we deny that Jesus built a church? When we go to Matthew 16, 18, 18 through 19, we read the Bible and it says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give to thee the keys to the what? Of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We realize that Jesus built the house. He built the church, and we realize that he promised that he would do that, right? Now, when we look at how important it is to have a Savior that's willing to die for us to have salvation, because when we go back to Genesis, we go back to the book of Genesis, we realize that the devil really thought that mankind was lost. How did God send his son? Because the devil thought in the day that they came of that tree, the man was treated by the bad moment. He thought that man would be lost that moment. But in mankind, God was lost. We have to remember that God loved us 
and his mercy toward them is a plan. And God set in a motion in plan, set a plan in motion that he would love us from the beginning of time, that we would have a right to the tree of life. Aren't you glad that Jesus was willing to die for you? Aren't you glad that God in his infinite wisdom loved us so much that he sent Jesus here? Sent him here and Jesus said, I came to die. The Bible says, let this one be a you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who been in the form of God, who been in the form of God, thought him not rather to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. It took him in the form of a servant. You see that word? Our king took on the form of a servant. To be a member of this king in this house, in this church, should we learn how to be servants? Should we be servants first? You know, sometimes we have to realize that that scripture says, humble yourself. Because Jesus did that. He humbled himself. He stepped down and he came obedient, even obedient to the death of the cross. Now, isn't a wonderful example that Jesus was willing to step down for us and die for us that we could be saved? Let's look at 1 Timothy 3 15. And let's see what the Bible says about this church. In Matthew 16 18, so I will build a church. 1 Timothy 3 15, it says, But if I tear alone, thou mayest know how thou ought to act and behave in the what? In the house of God. Which is what? The church. The king, the house, the church. The church of the living God, which is what? The pillar and the crown of truth. We realize that the church is the same. We look at people trying to divide things up and separate. Because many people said there is no history of the church in the Old Testament. There is no prophetic, prophetic word in the Old Testament of the church. There are no prophets talking about the church. The church just started in the New Testament. You know, people preaching what they were saying. And you know, they're preaching that because they don't want to trace it all the way back. Because they can't find authority for what they're doing. They can't find authority for how they're living. They can't find authority for how they preach. Do you realize that God has never forgotten anything? There is nothing that ever occurred to God. There's nothing that God said, whoops, I missed that. God had a plan from the beginning of time, from the foundation of the world. Uh, Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 4. He understood what he was doing and creating from the beginning. Now, when we look at this, we realize that we are on a solid foundation. We're on a solid foundation. And we don't have to worry about having big, big teams. We don't have to worry about uh, the churches getting smaller and smaller. Why do we believe that? I hear mean, preached all the time. But brother, look, I just don't believe that we should think about negativity of the church shrinking all the time. I hear that too much. What I believe we ought to do is go back to Matthew 5 and become soft and life and go back out and preach the word and see how many souls we could save. Do you know when Abraham was trying to save those poor souls in Sodom and Gomorrah? And as he negotiated for life of a better word with God, as he said, he said, what am I trying to get? Somebody tried to get them. What am I trying to get them? I can't get them. I can't get them. And he just kept going on. We should be concerned about packing our churches and filling up our pews. We ought to value one soul at a time. Now I'll get back to my lesson. I want to leave that Mark 9, verse 1. And he said, Well, I say unto you, that there be some, that, some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the what? 
kingdom of God coming with power. Luke 24 and 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tarry ye here in the city of what? Jerusalem. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be he be endued with power from on high. Now, we get to the book of Thank you. 
Yeah. Can we go back to Daniel 2 and verse 44? And that the kingdom will be divided as, as Brother Hilbert so eloquently showed us the slide that he was able to bring up, so I don't have to deal with Daniel a lot. And I realized that we could uh, save a little time on this. So Daniel 2, starting with verse 41, and it says that the kingdom would be divided. And, and we look at, at verse 42, and then we look at 43, and when we get to 44, we realize that God was saying, in the days of those kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be All 
Let's look at Acts 2 and 16 through 17. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it, and it shall come to pass in the last day. So glad that God loved us to give us things that when we realize we can read the Bible and we can see exactly how he put it together. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 and verse 13, it would be. And thou shalt sleep, when thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I shall set up thy seed after thee. Acts 2 and 39. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you on Patriarch David, before fear and glory and suffer for the things to do. He said, Hey, you just like the church prophesied in the Bible. And Jesus did. Acts 2 and 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church where the saints should be saved. Acts 2 and 2. The Lord's house shall be established. You see the contrast between 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13, Isaiah 2 and 2, Isaiah 2 and 3, and then Luke uh, 3, 31 and 33. All of the contrast. As to the knowledge of the people and the house and the church is all the same. And we realize looking at Daniel that we don't have to deal with tonight because Brother Hill did a wonderful job and I was going to close out on that. But brothers and sisters, I will close out with this. I'm so thankful that my God.